great. We're very glad to have Kai Barron from UBC, who's going to tell us about Donaldson Thomas theory of the quantum Fermat printer. Yes, so thanks. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation and giving me the opportunity to explain this work. So it's a uh, joint work uh, with uh, two of my students, Yu Shang Liu and Atsushi Kanazawa. And uh, you can, it's all, all up, written up in these archive papers there. And yeah. Okay, so, so the quantum from quintic. So what, what is it, first of all? So um, we start with quantum projective four space. Um, so that's the non-commutative graded algebra, um, which I've written down here. So this is P4 with a little Q for quantum and it's generated by, so this is the free algebra on five generators, zero to four. And um, these, these generators don't commute. Uh, so TI times TJ is not TJ TI, but up, they commute up to this uh, parameter here. So Q is a fixed fifth root of unity and then, um, you know, we, so all these are also the uh, nij are integers, so these are fifth roots of unity. So these the, the coordinates commute up to fifth roots of unity. And in fact, um, just to fix uh, uh, the formulas, um, so right, these there's this matrix that that uh, determines the commutation. And so here's the matrix. It's I, I can think of it as a five by five matrix with coefficients in the field of five elements. And, and here is like, like an example of such a matrix. <clears throat> um, so it has to be skew symmetric um, for you know, reasons of that this makes sense. Um, and um, I should make the remark that this is, um, even though it doesn't really, it looks really special, but in some sense it's generic. You can do uh, all kinds of certain kinds of simple operations uh, to the situation and, and transform anything into the situation. I don't want to say more about that, just it, or just take it as an example. Anyway, <clears throat> so note that the, the ti to the five um, are central elements. So they commute with everything because of uh, these being fifth roots of unity. And so um, <clears throat> if I look at the uh, this quantum, uh, sorry, the Fermat quintic equation, T0 to the fifth, all the way through T4 to the fifth, that's a central element in this, in this uh, quantum polynomial ring. And so it makes sense to divide by it, I, I get a graded ring or a graded C algebra. So I should think of this as like a, a, a hypersurface uh, in this quantum P4. So that's that's uh, the quantum Fermat quintic. So, so maybe as a, as a just to get started as a reality check. So I want to think of this as a geometric space, but there's like no uh, like, but we're just going to work completely with algebra and just kind of pretend. Kind yeah. Of, so uh, I'm going to. Um, so the first thing I want to say um, uh, a bit about geometry here. So there is this whole theory of non-commutative projective schemes, which is uh, which is due to Artin and Jang, and so they 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 make this kind of thing more geometric. So if you have one of these graded C algebras like, like S, um, yeah, they associate to, to this um, uh, such a uh, graded C algebra, what they call the proj of it. And the proj is a triple, um, a triple. So there's an abelian category, an object in the abelian category and an auto equivalence. And so the main thing is this, you know, we associate the abelian category, which you should, which is going to be the analog of the um, category of coherent sheaves um, on a projective scheme. So in this case, you take like the category of tails of finitely generated graded modules of the ring. So you take the finitely generated graded modules and you um, say two of them are equal if they differ only in finitely many degrees. So that defines uh, this this uh, I'm sorry, could, um, category. Could, could you do it um, just a little bit more basic thing in the special case where the C algebra is commutative? This triple should be something I can read off from the usual project. Yep. Could you yes, remind me how to do that? So, um, so uh, coherent sheaves on a projective scheme, you can think of them as modules over the graded ring. 
where you identify two modules if if they eventually agree in high enough degrees or they you know the difference between two modules is only infinitely in many degrees so that's um and then um and to move up early in your slide, um, the, uh, um, in, the, in the commutative case, the object, is that O of one? So the object, um, so if I start with this ring S, the object S itself defines ah. the structure sheaf. And, right? and then so, the auto equivalence um, is tensoring with O of one. Yes, Thanks. exactly. So, um, yeah, so, so in terms of the algebra, right, so I explained this Huger. Uh, this module S itself defines uh, an object in Huger, and then just shifting uh, defines an auto equivalence on this this category. So in general, we we have an abelian category, an object, and an auto equivalence, and this object is the structure sheaf, and the auto equivalence is the uh, tensoring with the twisting sheaf of Ser. And so you you can so I explained how to get from the ring to the triple if I want to. I can also start with a triple and define a ring. So that's the direct sum over all n of the harm in the in the Sabian category from the chosen object to uh, the chosen object um, shifted. So you know I apply this auto equivalence n times. And I take the direct sum um, and I can define a multiplication by that. So the multiplication is essentially the composition of homomorphisms, except for to be able to compose them, I have to twist the second one by the degree of the first one. And of course you can convince yourself that in the commutative case, in the commutative case, uh, if you have a, the coherent sheaves on a projective variety, the structure sheaf and the, the, um, the polarization that you get the, the uh, homogeneous coordinate ring. And so the Artin and Jang have this whole theory so that if you have enough conditions on S on the graded ring and enough conditions on the triple, you, you, this is even an equivalence of categories between these graded algebras and these triples, except for on the graded algebra side, um, you know, two of them, you'd have to identify two of them again if they differ by a finite module. Um, Okay, so first theorem, um, so by Kanazawa. So for this quantum Fermat quintic, <clears throat> and this is in fact for any um, matrix of commuting conditions, um, this, this BN category Q GER Q um, satisfies these conditions. It has global dimension three, and it is a Calabria three category, um, if and only if uh, this particular vector here is an eigenvector of that matrix. So that's some kind of technical condition. Um, <clears throat> what do these two conditions mean? So the first condition, um, global dimension three, means that um, the, all the X groups vanish um, for the index bigger than three. And the Calabria three condition is that if I have the X I between E and F, and I take the dual, that's the same as X three minus I, um, and I also, you know, reverse the order of the F and E. <clears throat> right. So this is an analog of, for example, if you had a um, commutative Calabria threefold, then these two conditions would hold in the category of um, coherent sheaves. <clears throat> And so you should think of, of the first condition as that this Fermat quintic, uh, non commutative Fermat quintic, is smooth of dimension three. And the second condition is a Calabria, you can think of it as non commutative Calabria threefold. Um, and because of this, uh, this um, Calabria three thing, uh, you expect that modular spaces of objects in this category um, should admit a Donaldson Thomas theory. <clears throat> yeah, so I'll explain you know, what that, all that means later on. But um, we were not able to construct it using techniques from non commutative projective geometry. So somehow thinking, you know, and going through the literature, um, you know, started by Artin and Jang, and this whole theory didn't get us very far at all. Um, so instead, um, let's talk about cheese of Frobenius algebras. And it all depends on the fact that Q, 
So Q is my shorthand notation for this quantum Fermat quintic, this algebra, um, the twisted homogeneous coordinate ring divided by the, the, the um, Fermat equation. This um, has a central subalgebra over which it is finite. The central algebra is of course going to be commutative. So really this thing is not so far from being commutative itself. So let me explain that. And so here's, um, here's uh, Q, here's our non-commutative um, quintic, right? <clears throat> So if uh, I already mentioned that the fifth powers of the coordinates are central. So if I take the subalgebra generated by the fifth powers um, of the coordinates, that's a commutative subalgebra. And these, these things commute. And so that's just the polynomial ring in these, in these uh, five generators. And um, right here's the equation that they have to satisfy. So, so now I'm just going to call the, the fifth powers of these ti, I'm going to call them x. I. So, so this is a poly polynomial ring um, in five variables. So that's the usual P4, commutative P4. And the equation there is just this equation of a hyperplane. Right. And so, so this, this is a commutative story is, is a hyperplane uh, in P4. So it's P3. So this is, this is basically a, just a P3. And so this is an algebra over this subalgebra. And so we can construct from this a locally free sheaf of algebras over this, this OX. And it's going to turn out to have rank 625. Um, if you wanted to, uh, yeah, so I guess I have to tell you a bit about the structure of this algebra here. Um, <clears throat> so this sheaf of algebras over P3. So because these, these, um, these generators of the commutative subalgebra here, they all have degree five, um, it's best to pass to the degree five uh, Veronese subalgebra here, right? So, so that means that I, I, it's, I'm just now considering monomials uh, whose degree is divisible by five. And so, so if I actually, I don't even, uh, let me ignore the equation for now. So just look at this, this um, uh, non-commutative uh, polynomial ring. Um, right, so this is a graded free module over the subalgebra. And the basis um, is these monomials um, which I write so in, in this in this way. So um, you know, as the exponent is a vector with five components, um, so k i is between zero and four, and um, yeah, each k i is between zero and four, and the sum of the k i k i has to be equal to the to five. And that's that gives me a basis of this thing over that, and then it you know it also gives a basis for this over that, and so you can count. Um, these conditions, there's exactly 625 such vectors. And so <clears throat> as an OX module, um, my algebra looks like this. So, so right now, everything you're saying is going to work just fine with the usual quintic. Uh, in fact, it doesn't even, uh, and so. Uh, yeah, lots of stuff uh, uh, doesn't uh, uh, use the fact that we're actually non-commutative. Yeah. I, I mean, presumably, I'm going to watch for it, but never will you use the fact that it's non-commutative. You just will never use the fact that it's commutative. Right? I will at some point um, when I get it concrete, use okay. that it's non-commutative. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So in in the commutative case, what I'm what I'm doing here is I'm I'm uh, yeah I'm sort of I'm taking the usual quintic um, in. Uh, P4 and projecting it to P3. So it becomes a ramified cover of P3. And that's my thinking now. And then it becomes a finite dimensional, I mean, finite locally, finite, uh, finite rank locally free algebra over OX. So X is always P3. And so, uh, you know, you work out, out the, the, all these graded things. And so as a, uh, as a sheaf of, uh, as a sheaf of modules, so a coherent sheaf on OX, it looks like this, right? So there's, there's 
here's just one copy of OX, then there's many copies of these, these in between guys, and then there's only one copy of X minus four. And so <clears throat> I can define projection from A onto OX minus four and compose that with multiplication in A and I get a perfect pairing. So from um, A tensor A, um, <clears throat> so I, so, I, so what, is, what is this pairing? I take um, A tensor A to the product AB and then just project it into that, that components, which I denote by trace. And if I do that, then you see that there's every time, um, you know, I have a T to the K, it's dual. So maybe it's in here, then there's a dual guy over here. So T four minus K. <clears throat> and this pairing is gonna be symmetric exactly if, if this thing is equal to that thing. And if you work out, you know, explicitly what that means in terms of the commuting conditions, it means that one is an eigenvector of n. So this weird condition um, that I came up in, in that theorem was that um, comes from here to make this pairing here symmetric. Sorry, um, something is interfering. Okay, so we got an example of the following situation. So let me make a general definition. Um, so let X be a smooth scheme. So as I said in our example, that's or the base D3 and A, a locally free sheaf of OX algebras. So it could be non-commutative. Um, and with a symmetric perfect pairing, um, A tensor A to omega X. So that's the dualizing sheaf of X. You know, I should have pointed out that's of course the main thing here that OX minus four is a dualizing sheaf of X because X is P3. So there's my definition. If I have a symmetric perfect pairing like this, I call that a sheaf of Frobenius algebras over X. I mean, all fibers of this thing. So for every point in X, I have a finite dimensional algebra as fiber. And those are all going to be Frobenius algebras. But to have a nice global um, story, I, I need the pairing to have values in the dualizing sheaf of X, which you'll see next. So if, um, so if the sheaf of algebras has finite global dimension, where the dimension is actually the dimension of the base, and then it has a dualizing bimodule. So that's, uh, That's, uh, I mean, yeah, if you're familiar with, um, so if you have a finite cover and you want to construct the dualizing sheaf on a finite cover, um, this is, you always use this formula to take the dualizing sheaf on the base and then you do, do HOM OX from the structure sheaf of the finite cover into omega X. That's, it works the same way in the non-commutative case. But in the non-commutative case, I have to know that it's a bimodule, which it is. Um, Hey Kai. Yeah. Normally, in the uh, the way I often think of the dualizing sheaf from a finite branch cover, the formula involves the ramification divisor. Is there a way to think oh. about ramification divisor in this context? I don't know. I always just use this formula here. Really? Isn't it normally like canonical on the base tensor ramification pulled back or something like that, or maybe maybe you have to tensor with ramification upstairs. Anyway, but this is an upper shriek. But this is an upper shriek now. He's doing something. Uh, yeah, this is exactly yeah. the upper shriek. This is ah. a construction of upper shriek of, mean? of where A is the the sheaf of algebras giving you the finite cover of X. Which really seems to lose the geometry. Like I really have a hard time. Like yeah, I, I I have that that question is one I've always had that that, that Jim asked that I have no answer to. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. It, anyway it, so this it works. I mean, I don't want to. Yeah. This, can I can, can I go back to the definition yeah. of Frobenius algebra? So yeah. right, right. So what you've done is you've taken this finite flat cover of P three and it's non commutative P three. I understand and. It's non this thing is non commutative, and I just don't worry about that. It's just I just have non commutative sheaf of algebras. And I have what, I th what I'm going to think is the dualizing sheet, and I'll use the same construction which you wrote down. And then you have this pairing. It's like the, and this pairing, so the Frobenius, the 
Frobenius algebra structure is like a pairing that takes you from things to things upstairs and takes you into things on P3. Was that what it was? Or what was the Frobenius algebra? Yeah, so it's a pairing as, you know, we were thinking of always as sheaf of algebras over OX. So the pairing is like um, bilinear over OX, right? So everything is happening basically in the fibers. Except so for, this is like, is it like zero duality? It's like relative zero duality. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so the, the point is, so you can just formally write this, write down this thing, prove it's, it, it, it's a dualizing, it do, does the dualizing thing in the sense that X, you know, X I, so over A of F G is X N minus I to where you reverse F and G and put this, 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 this guy in there and take a dual. And it just is a formal thing. It's the same, it's, it's just, it's a very formal proof that, that this just holds. It follows from ser duality on the base, of course, mainly, and some formulas. And I mean, it, it's, it's the same proof as in the commutative case that this is a dualizing sheaf on the finite cover. Um, There's the same proof that gives you that. And so the whole thing is that, um, Okay, so this is this holds for all f and g in in this category here. So this is an important. So these are the so these are coherent sheaves of A algebra. So I can sorry A modules. So this means they're um, sheaves of A modules, but they're as if I forget about the A structure and just remember the O X structure, they're coherent sheaves as O X modules. I can also think of them just as coherent O X modules with the structure of a left multiplication by A. So sorry, when I say modules over non-commutative, I mean left modules. So that's what this category is here. And so this asymmetric pairing like this um, gives us an identification of this, of this dualizing sheaf, this dualizing guy here with A, right? So if I have this perfect pairing, I, I, it goes, I can think of it also like, sorry, like this, A goes to um, a dual tensor omega X, which is this guy, right? So, and that's, so that gives me an isomorphism from A with this guy. So it turns out that then, um, so the symmetric pairing identifies this with A, which means then I can, in my formula, I can get rid of this guy and I have the Calabi-Yau um, condition. So the coherent A modules become a calabi yau N category, in our case, calabi yau 3 category. So I want to remark that in our situation, this, this what I earlier had explained as q gur of Q, so this, this category of tails of the algebra, uh, of this algebra, right, is actually um, equivalent to this category of coherent um, A modules of the sheaf of algebras over the base. Three. That's not hard to prove. So in, instead of trying to um, study objects, modular of objects here, we study objects here, which is much simpler because we're basically in a commutative situation, with only a finite, relatively finite non-commutative situation. Mm -hmm. So I said, as I want, I want to think of these as coherent modules over OX with structures of a left A module. Okay, <clears throat> so moduli spaces of, of such pairs. So now I'm going to fix um, the situation as above. So to remind you, X is a smooth projective scheme with some um, twisting sheaf. A is a locally free, sheaf, locally free sheaf of Frobenius algebras over X. Mm. <clears throat> like the one given by the quantum from our quintic. And we assume that A has finite global dimension, which is some kind of extra condition on like the Frobenius algebra globally being smooth over X is not something that is just purely in the fibers. But it's like, you know, like if you have a ramified cover, it could, you know, it doesn't look so good relatively, but could still be smooth globally. And, <clears throat> And so we're going to talk Hilbert polynomials. Hilbert polynomials, Hilbert polynomials are with respect to uh, just the base, the projective scheme OX. So P of F of I is, is given by this formula. And so 
<clears throat> the good thing is that now we're in the situation we, we can take the whole moduli theory off the shelf because um, Carl Simpson has already done it. I mean, he wasn't really interested in this situation as far as I know, but his theory applies. So, um, so such a such an object F, uh, the coherent A module is um, semi-stable. If so, first of all, it's pure as an um, OX module and for all proper sub-modules, um, we have, so the, the um, this is like the Giesecker stability condition or the Simpson stability condition. Um, you know, the Hilbert polynomial normalized is less than the Hilbert polynomial normalized um, if I gets large enough. So this is just, just generalization of standard facts. And then all the standard things you expect to hold. So pure modules have harder Norris-Simon filtrations, semi-stable modules have jordan Helder filtrations, so semi-stable modules. The, you know, there's this notion of S equivalence of semi-stable modules. So meaning that, you know, the jordan, jordan Helder filtrations have the same or isomorphic simple components. Um, and if, if an object is stable, then its endomorphisms are just scalars. And we get modular spaces. So we fix a polynomial H and then we, um, so the first thing we consider is, so semi-stable A modules with Hilbert polynomial H, that's this thing here, semi-stable with Hilbert polynomial H. It's an Artin stack of finite type with a good modular space. So there's a there's a decent modular space for these guys. Same thing as the user, you know, commutative theory. Um, <clears throat> um, this this modular space, so um, this modular space M um, is a projective scheme and it classifies S equivalence classes or equivalently polystable sheaves, if you know what that is. Um, <clears throat> if you pass to the stable objects, um, then if you go from the stack to the modular space, it's actually a C star gerb. Um, yeah. <clears throat> meaning there's not much difference between the stack and the, the only difference is that that you know you have more you have these non-trivial automorphisms this is a technical annoyance um, but anyway it's true and then um, the stable locus is open in the semi-stable ones and it classifies isomorphism classes not just s equivalence classes okay then there's also um, a Hilbert scheme which is actually completely easy to to define, it's just, so the Hilbert scheme of, of A is just a sub, closed subscheme of the quad scheme of A, right? I think of A as a locally free sheaf on X and I take a quad scheme, classifying all the coherent um, A modules with an epimorphism. So I have a quotient of A as an OX module such that the structure of A module on A passes to F. Or, you know, in other words, words the kernel is an is a left ideal, right? So that's just a closed subscheme. So, so the theory, and so in terms of uh, making everything you're saying precise, it sounds like everything just as precise without, like, for quote schemes, you just use quote schemes on P three, uh, and everything you're saying. And you just define the Hilbert scheme as as a as a closed. Yeah, this yeah, is right. so literally all, this all, is literally just a closed subscheme of yeah. quad of P three. Right. I mean, quotients of that six hundred twenty five rank locally free yeah. sheaf on P three, um, or the quotients of that that are compatible with the left A module structure. Great. So that compatibility is the closed condition. Yeah, that is a closed condition. Got it. Um, as I said, it's just the condition that the kernel is a left sub module of A, which is just a bunch of equations and it's a closed sub scheme. So, if, so for this guy, you don't have to do any further construction. You don't have to quote um, Simpson, but for the, the general guys, you want to quote Simpson. <clears throat> and like in classical Donaldson-Thomas theory, there there's this thing that that we 
we we often are interested in the Hilbert scheme. So we all, we're interested in subschemes of our Fermat quintic, zero dimensional, one dimensional subschemes. Uh, but really we want to think of them as sheaves and, and use the, the deformation theory as sheaves and, the, and think of the modest space of sheaves. So we really want a, a, a map from the Hilbert scheme to this modest space of stable sheaves. And so the way we do that, so we have an epimorphism uh, from A to F, we pass to the kernel of, and think of that as a sheaf in its own right, forgetting about its embedding into A. And so I do that because the Hilbert scheme is easier to handle, but this other guy over here has better deformation theory. <clears throat> and so then there's some technical conditions under which we can prove that this uh, first guy is just a bunch of connected components of the second guy. So um, let me um, just sort of gloss over this a bit. So one condition is that generically, so over the generic point, this is the function field of the base, the function field of P3. If I pass to the generic point, I just have an algebra over this field. And if that algebra over that field is a division ring, um, right, then you, then, uh, you can easily see that that this guy always, this kernel always ends up being stable. And if you have another condition here on H1 of X with values in A being zero, then you can prove some deformation theory that it's an open immersion. So you get a, you get a morphism from the first condition. It's an open immersion from this condition. So it's, but then of course the Hilbert scheme is proper. So if it's open sub scheme, but it's proper, then it just, has to be a bunch of components of this. So the Hilbert scheme is a union of connected components of a corresponding uh, modular space of stable sheaves under these conditions. So there is a commutative analog that the Hilbert scheme XA um, is a modular space of torsion free rank one sheaves with trivial determinant. But we don't have determinant, we don't, we just, yeah, whatever. Okay, so Donaldson Thomas uh, theory for pairs XA. All right, so now we got the moduli spaces. Now we have to define numerical numbers out of them. So again, here's my setup smooth projective base, locally free sheet for Frobenius algebras. Um, and so Leo um, proves that. Um, this uh, modular space of stable um, of stable coherent A modules carries a symmetric obstruction theory. Symmetric obstruction theory implies that it's perfect of virtual dimension zero. So I'm sorry, I'm using all these words. Um, if you're not familiar with them, I don't know. Anyway, can't really help you. Um, Anyway, deform so the deformation, such a deformation theory R always comes with a deformation space. So this is, if I have such an object, a stable sheaf, it's infinitesimal deformations are, are given by this X1 of FF. The obstruction space is X2 of FF. That's general deformation theory. In this Calabi-Yau case, this is dual to that. So the obstruction space is dual to the deformation space, which makes this, that's the definition of symmetric obstruction theory. And such a thing um, has therefore a virtual fundamental class. Um, yeah, um, and because of this, 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 obstructions and deformations being dual to each other, the virtual dimension is zero, right? Which would be this dimension of this minus that is zero. So I get a zero, uh, zero degree element. Ah, so one, th one thing you snuck by me without me really noticing was that all these moduli spaces are commutative. Like we're all, we're in a, we're, we're still in our happy world. I mean, the, the space we're studying. Yeah, no, the, the moduli spaces are, class, are, are all commutative things, yes. I don't think we, no, we don't, no, yeah, even though the, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, that's just, yeah, 
we don't, yeah, so we're back in the commutative world here. I don't know there's some remarks here why, um, you know, if you want to construct this obstruction theory, um, you think you might need a, the universal bundle. I mean, you kind of, the, the gerb gets in your way um, a bit, but um, there's a reason why it doesn't get in your way. So I, I guess, um, I, I think ghosting behind Ravi's question, um, if I think about the, the more general theory, um, should I always expect a moduli space of she's on a non-commutative scheme to be um, a commutative scheme? Yeah, I mean, in the end, I'm just interested in some uh, objects in some abelian category. I mean, I, I use this non-commutative situation to get at, to define this abelian category of coherent A modules, which are coherent OX modules with some non-commutative operators on them. But once I have the, when I study moduli of, moduli of objects in an abelian category, my moduli spaces are, um, I'm only interested in commutative moduli spaces. Okay, thanks. And, and um, just to make sure I understand, so you're only interested in them, um, but would you make the stronger statement that you shouldn't expect there to be a rich theory of non-commutative moduli spaces or? Well, I, I, I'll go as far as saying that they're derived moduli spaces, um, but yeah, okay, so these, behind this, this symmetric obstruction theory, of course, underlies the fact that really these, these uh, modular spaces are derived modular spaces with a shifted symplectic structure. So then they should have a Poisson structure and then you have a Poisson structure. So really they, they should be just the commutative limit of something non-commutative, but that like, I, you know, I don't, we don't need all that to define Thanks. the Thomas invariance. Thanks. But again, that that's that that would also hold for for modular spaces of commutative things. I mean, that the whole that whole non-commutative theory of the minor spaces. So, okay, so so we have to choose a polynomial such that semi-stable implies stable, so that our modular spaces are proper. So that the modular space is proper, and so again, this you can convince yourself that if, if your algebra is generically a division algebra and you consider sheaves that are so of dimension dimension x so they're torsion free and they have the same rank as, as the algebra itself. Then um, you can de define the Donaldson Thomas invariant, which is just the degree of the virtual fundamental class, which is then well defined because I have a proper modular space. <clears throat> and so if my two conditions up there, technical conditions are satisfied so that um, the Hilbert scheme is just a component of this guy or a bunch of components of this guy, I can also just take uh, the degree of the virtual fundamental class on that. And these are deformation invariants because they're defined using intersection theory. But <clears throat> I should remark, we don't really have much uh, we don't really, I, we never, we don't know how much the situation deforms because you have to choose these fifth root of unity, which are kind of stuck where they are. So you can't really deform those. <clears throat> Datsushi remarked that you could introduce like, you could throw in a, like a X zero to X four. Um, yeah, some Lambda X zero to X four. Um, into your equation and get like a one parameter deformation at least, but anyway. <clears throat> and we are interested in this partition function. So <clears throat> we're now only gonna be interested in uh, whether Hilbert polynomial is constant. So our modules are actually just finite length modules over P3 with this A module structure on them. And so <clears throat> the I sum these these Thomas and Tom, Donaldson Thomas invariants for n into a generating series, and I get this partition function. Okay, I should remark that since our virtual um, fundamental class is defined in terms of a symmetric obstruction theory, that these uh, Donaldson Thomas invariants um, are actually just Euler characteristics. So the Donaldson-Thomas invariant of this guy is actually just the Euler characteristic of the 
modular space of the Hilbert scheme, the topological Euler characteristic with a weight. So there is a weight, which is called nu. It's a weighted Euler characteristic. So that's a general theorem that I proved a while back. So nu is a generalized Miller number. Um, it's an integer invariant of a singularity or a germ of an analytic space. So anytime I have a germ of an analytic space, I have an integer, which is new. Come on, Kai, cop, call it by its proper name. No, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> so here are some properties of it. So it's a constructible function, which means it's constant on strata, strata of a stratification. If X happens to be the critical locus of a holomorphic function of a smooth complex manifold, then it's, it's like this. And it's just uh, basically the Euler characteristic of the Milner fiber. Um, and if X, uh, sorry, if this smooth manifold on which this holomorphic function is defined admits a C star action where the P is an isolated fixed point and F is homogeneous, then it's just, uh, up, you know, minus dim, so it's just, just plus or minus one, depending on the dimension of the Zariski tangent space of your space you're interested in. So we can compute this DT invariant as a weighted Euler characteristic. This is like, yeah. Okay, um, so far along am I here? <clears throat> so to, to explain how we're doing this computation, I have to back up and explain or review briefly a few highlights of how to do it for the commutative quintic. So here's a brief backup to the, so we want the same uh, partition function. So here it's Hilb and Y. So the just, so Y is now a commutative quintic threefold. Um, <clears throat> so you can think of the, you know, the Fermat quintic in the commutative P4. Um, here you have the, Hilbert scheme of length and subschemes. It's a uh, weighted Euler characteristic, and I sum those numbers into a generating series. It all depends on the punctual Hilbert scheme that you can do this calculation. So, what's the punctual Hilbert scheme? It's a closed subscheme of the Hilbert scheme. So, I choose a point, I choose a point in, in Y, and I look at all the subschemes of length n which are supported at that point. So, that's like you know, so that's the fat point P. So it's fat of fatness N. So there's lots of different ways it can be fat. Um, and of course it can't, doesn't have to be just a fat point. It could also just be, you know, uh, no, no, sorry, punctual Hilbert scheme. Yeah, all the end points come together at the point P. <clears throat> and, um, What's written here? So here's just, uh, okay, this is just the definition of the partition function of Y. So whereas where I have the Euler characteristic of Hilp and Y with respect to the, its weight function, then if I look at just uh, the same thing for, for the punctual Hilbert scheme, so Hilp and Y at the point P, this punctual Hilbert scheme, I still have to take the weights with respect to this ambient thing, the weights, don't depend on this closed subscheme. They depend on the ambient things. So that's why the notation got a bit more complicated. But um, there is some magic using cutting and pasting um, of these virtual Euler characteristics and magic of generating functions that gives us this formula here. That the, um, so the, the partition function for Y, so the whole thing, is it's just the partition function of the punctual guide to the power of the Euler characteristic of y. And the Euler characteristic is minus 200 in this case. So, um, and this holds for any choice of, and it doesn't matter, p is an arbitrary choice of point that doesn't matter. Yeah, all the okay. points on the, we're on the commutative quintic here, and it's smooth, all the points are identical. Thanks. That's going to be different in the non commutative case. So, um, can I, sorry, Kai, can I just make a quick? Yeah. Sort of question slash comment. I mean, this this move here is really using the the map from the Hilbert scheme to the symmetric product. So it's it's really using the um, Hilbert Chow morphism. You're pushing forward the Euler characteristic measure, and then you're using fact that symmetric products, you know, in the in the Grotendieck group 
uh, motives have the have these magic properties, right? Yes, so that, I was just I, my next words were going to be ask Jim if you want to know how to prove this. Uh, well, but, but so, <laughs> so the, I, I, the actually, question that that's that tied makes me, along with that, that makes me happy. Actually, I, I think you were answering my question. So, so in fact, uh, there's that's the magic. I was going to say there's magic there, but the magic is exactly that magic. The magic is that the symmetric products give you a lambda ring structure on the on the uh, Grotendi group of varieties and and Euler characteristics yeah. factor through that. But what the point I wanted to make is that map from Hilb to symmetric product, you could also view as the map from framed modules, which is your Hilbert scheme, to just modules, the coarse moduli space of modules, right? If I have, if I have, you know, my ideal sheaves, I think of as a framed structure street. Now I forget about the frame and I just remember the structure sheaf, then in S equivalence classes, you're just remembering the, the location. And so that's a move that you could ask about in this non-commutative world, going from the framed module to the unframed module and pushing forward the, the, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the Baron no, function. You're, you're, of course, you're getting ahead of, of, of me here. Oh, know. sorry. Anyway, so I just wanted to, that question about, um, about all points being equal. So if I have an arbitrary point P on my commutative Calabio threefold Y, um, so its punctual Hilbert scheme inside the whole Hilbert scheme is exactly the same as the punctual Hilbert scheme of the origin in of C3 and the Hilbert scheme of C3. So what is, what is equal is that this punctual Hilbert scheme is the same one as this one. And a whole neighborhood of this one in here is isomorphic to a whole neighborhood of this one in here. So I summarize that by saying that the germ of this closed subscript inside here is isomorphic to the germ of this guy in here. And so I've replaced the arbitrary point in Y with the specific point zero in C3. So they're all the same. And um, right, so because of these germs being equal, these weighted Euler characteristics are equal. Right, because the Euler characteristic of this is the same, and then the weights are the same because the weights depend only on the germ. Yeah. So I get that formula. And using the C star action and the property three of this weight function that I reviewed up there gives you that this Euler characteristic of this C three at zero is has to do with you know counting three D partitions of N. And so you count these three D partitions and you get the McMahon function at minus C. So that's the generating function of three D partitions. And so you put it all together, you get that the, um, this partition function of the commutative quintic is McMahon function evaluated minus T to the minus 200. Okay, so this, um, so, um, so more about this Hilb and C3, those are, so those are the length and quotient modules of the polynomial ring and three variables. This is the same thing as a stable representations of a quiver with relations. Here's the quiver. It's got one point and three loops, which are labeled X, uh, Y, and Z. So the relations, um, right, so, so if I look at this quiver, the path algebra of this quiver is, is um, the free algebra on these th three generators, X, Y, and Z. So it's tensor algebra. So if I want to get from there to the polynomial ring, I have to introduce these commuting relations that the three um, coordinates commute with, commute with each other. These relations come from a potential on this quiver. This is the potential on the quiver. And so um, we have a dimension vector um, is N. So that says we want um, you know, representations of the quiver where this vector space on that vertex has dimension n, and there's a framing vector um, um, corresponding to the fact that your quotient, yeah, we're looking at quotient, not just modules by themselves, but quotients of this guy. Um, <clears throat> so that's the Hilbert scheme and C3, and then the punctual guy at origin is the nilpotent representation. So those are all representations where if I just commute, just compose often enough the three, these three matrices, I get zero. 
Right, because these three, um, the X, Y, and Z, so acting, you know, on this on this module, are the coordinates of the module, and so if the coordinates are zero, that corresponds to nilpotent matrices. I mean, the eigen values of those matrices are the coordinates, and if they're zero, the matrices are nilpotent. <clears throat> And of course, uh, really, this quiver is um, how do you so? How do you get this quiver? The quiver is the x quiver of the simple object. So I, I look at just the skyscraper sheaf at the point P, which is a coherent sheaf on a Y, and it's also a simple object. And <clears throat> so I, there's this. Okay, so there's, let me just briefly explain this X quiver. So there's one vertex of the quiver because I have one, just I'm considering one simple object. And <clears throat> then I look at the uh, X one of this S with itself, the space of ex extensions um, dual. Right, so that's the three dimensional space, which uh, basis gives you corresponds to coordinates of on Y near P. And the arrows of this um, X quiver always give come from a basis, are given by a basis of X1. So the path algebra, the free algebra on, on this uh, three-dimensional uh, vector just space. Just a second. Yeah. Sorry, ignore me. Yeah, so um, mm, the Yoneda product um, from X1, tensor X1 to X2, dually defines these, these three relations and the quotient. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm going over this uh, too fast, but anyway, I just wanna, what, I'm, what are you supposed to get out of this? That there's a way to get um, at the quiver. So this, this quiver um, is in charge of the punctual Hilbert scheme. Right, which is the key to the whole thing. Um, and this quiver comes just by looking at the simple object and, and it, it's, it's Yoneda algebra of extensions. So the X algebra, right? The main thing being uh, that, the, that the loops come from a basis of X1. So you have as many loops as you have um, dimension here in X1. So now um, I, I need to, of course, get to the, the non-commutative quintic. So there- um, Kai, didn't you really want O sub P to the N, like a direct sum of N copies of O sub P to get the quiver you want? No, I just want one. Um, the direct copies I'm, I'm taking care of by taking a dimension vector N. But this algebra, the, 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 what, is the what is the vector space? So the, the quiver, vector space? So the, the al the x algebra the whole x x algebra um, is the um, alternating algebra on a three dimensional vector space, mm. and you okay. get like the causal dual to that is the polynomial ring, and that gives you local description of the of the quintic. Anyway, I I need to say a few words okay. of this before my time runs out. So. We're only interested in the zero dimensional, uh, so finite length modules, which even if I forget about the A structure, just over X over P3, that's just a finite length module. So these are all localized you know, in X. So I can pass to a affine open in X. So I can, I can study things locally on, on, on this hyperplane in P4. So I'm gonna do this by setting the first coordinate equal to one. And then, um, you know, I get these inhomogeneous coordinates out of the homogeneous coordinates by this formula. And so I now have the, the affine piece in the base. So, which is now, um, so the linear equation is now that the coordinates sum to minus one and uh, the, the non-commutative one is now generated by these four guys the equation has become, you know, the sum of the coordinates is equal to minus one. And I have new, these, these new U1 through U4, they're variations on the T1 through T4, but they have a little bit different commuting relations 
first of all, I only have four of them because I've dehomogenized. And so now they've made the commuting things are, are governed by this four by four matrix, which I computed, which is straightforward to compute, convince yourself. And so let's first look at the point modules. So point modules is where n is equal to one. So that's where the underlying OX module just has length one. So those are representations of this algebra here um, on just the one dimensional vector space C. So uh, these, these guys U1 through U4 have to act on the module. And so if they act on C, they just become numbers. So I have numbers U1 through U4. U1 through U4 turn into numbers. Numbers, of course, commute, but then I also have these non-trivial commuting relations. And if they commute and non-trivially and non-commute, this is only possible if, if uh, at most one of these coordinates is non-zero, all have to be zero except for one, then that thing's possible. So at most one of these U134 is non-zero. So let's say um, U2, U3, U4 are zero and U1 is not, zero. So U1 is not zero, but U1, you know, if these guys are all zero, then U1 to the fifth has to be equal to minus one. So U1 is a, can be written like this. So it has five choices. It has, you know, it's, it's the negative of a fifth root of unity. So that means I have five point modules corresponding to these five options here. Five point modules all supported over this point of X, which has homogeneous coordinates one minus one, zero, 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 right? I had set the first guy equal to one by dehomogenizing. And then the second guy was minus one because um, well, the coordinates all have to add up to zero. That's the definition of the hyperplane in P4. And these guys all have to be zero. So they're all supported here. So there's, there's so there's, in this case, so there's, there's over the, these points, there's five simple modules, not just one, like in the commutative case. And of course, there's how many of such points are there? Well, I, there's five coordinates and three of them have to be zero. So that's 10 of them. There's 10 such points in the base. So altogether, I have 50 point modules. Right? Over each of these 10 points, I have five. That's 50 altogether. So there's 50 point modules over my quantum from our quintic. So that's I've now actually computed one of these VT invariants, namely Hilb one to be 50. And it's an actual count of 50 points. In contrast with a commutative case, this was like the negative Euler characteristic of the quintic, which is 200. And so, yeah. Okay, so, um, okay, so my time is up. So, um, it's, I guess I um, have to go briefly over this. And um, so, mm, so, you know, if we fix one of these special points in the base, <clears throat> and then I have, look at my five simple modules that are located on top of that. Um, I should, the quiver that describes what's going on at this point. So the punctual Hilbert scheme, the quiver um, should be the X quiver of the direct sum of these five things. So, um, so here's that quiver. So there's um, S0, S1, S2, S3, S4. Those are the five simple modules. And then you can compute when, when you can have extensions between them. And you see that, so yeah, yeah, if I had more time, I could explain that. But so these are various extensions you get. It's, it's kind of amusing that this is a um, degree five cover of the of the commutative quiver. But that's that's seemingly at this point a coincidence. Like it, there's no reason. Sorry? That's a coincidence though at this point. Yeah, that I don't know. That seems to be just a coincidence. I mean, um, yeah. I mean, okay. So I. You know, if, if I, so I'm gonna have to skip the all my reasons why you know why this is a quiver. It's not so hard to see that at least uh, the quiver looks like this. Um, the relations are, are a bit more trickier. I mean, here's here's the potential. 
where these a i b i and c i are, are the labels for the for for the edges here so i have b0 b0 b1 b2 b3 b4 these are these outer edges and the a's are these orange edges and the c's are the blue edges and so there's five five of each type and so i can uh, also the potential right if i squint my eyes and pretend this is like BAC and this is BCA, it looks very much like the commutative guy. But in really here, of course, um, this, this, this single potential actually gives rise to 15 um, equations. Right, I mean, the path algebra has 15 generators um, corresponding to these arrows. You also need 15 relations. <clears throat> Here's just one of an example of such a relation that if I go like this is the same as if I go like that. Um, but so anyway, long story short, um, so the contribution of these special points um, is given by by the the partition function of of the a at the p, so the punctual guy, which is um, so the partition function of the this quiver which I just showed you with this potential and with a certain framing vector. <clears throat> so I'll write that like this. And so since there's 10 of these points, I get a factor of this uh, partition function for the quiver to the 10 in my final answer. And you can convince yourself that, that this is also the generating function for some combinatorial problem, but we were not able to come up with a close formula for this thing so <clears throat> that takes care of the special points now if you go away from these 10 special points you can show that the algebra is basically just a, a sheaf of so it's like a matrix algebra five by five matrices over uh, something commutative um, and so that's not so interesting because as far as modules go, um, I mean, this algebra is, is Morita equivalent to that algebra. The modules over this thing are the same as the modules over the commutative thing. So in the end, um, away from those special points, it just looks like a commutative. With, with respect to representations, representations, it looks just like a commutative guy. And so you can think about that a bit and that gives you just a McMahon functor, McMahon factor like this. And so the total thing gives you that. Yeah, so that's the final answer um, of this partition function. I guess that's um, all I want.